I'm William Bell with Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. Welcome to Probing the Prophets with Rod MacArthur. Join us every Friday from 11 a.m. until 12 noon Central Standard Time for an exciting adventure through the prophets with Rod MacArthur. Rod MacArthur, husband, father, grandfather, gardener of roses and veggies, Bible student, enamored of the prophets since 1972, hosts a discussion 40 years in the making. Currently living in Auburn, Washington, Rod has preached in Moscow, Idaho, Spokane, Washington, and Terre Haute, Indiana, before moving to Auburn. Welcome to Probing the Prophets with Rod. Good morning. This is Rod. Did you know that Jude was the brother of Jesus? There's an interesting thing. I was studying with a young couple last night, and we were reading of the statements of Jesus on the cross, where he said to the disciple whom he loved, Behold your mother. Then he turned and said to his mother, Behold your son. And from that moment on, that disciple took her into his family. Jesus had brothers, James and Joseph and Judas, uh, to mention three. He had brothers. Why did he not entrust his mother to one of them? Why to someone outside the family? Great question. We know this. From John 7, when Jesus was going up to the Feast of the Tabernacles, uh, his brothers, it says, for not even his brothers believed in him. It wasn't until after his resurrection that they came to faith. Sidebar, I suspect that that was a fascinating study if we knew the details, how it came that they grappled with their suspicions, their ridicule, their mockery, their um, downplaying of his claims, his childhood fantasies to be somebody special and all of that. How it came to be that they dismissed all those ideas and embraced the new truth that he was in fact the Messiah that all Israel had been hoping for since the time of David and before. That's a sidebar. The point is, Judas was not entrusted with the care of his mother at that time, but later became a very prominent writer. As we saw last week, Jude picked up where Peter left off in Second Peter in saying that it's more important It's more, there is more, there is more. It's not enough to just hang on to your faith, determine of what kind of person you're going to be and determine to be found by him in peace and righteousness, that there was more to being a faithful follower of Jesus in times of deep turmoil, distress, uh, persecution, uh, upheaval. There's more. And that more is found in the book of Jude. I wanted to talk to you about our common salvation, but I was constrained, impelled, driven to talk to you, to contend, wrestle, struggle intently, intensely for the faith that was delivered. Stand up and defend it. Uh, Do not let it become distorted, perverted, Uh, twisted, uh, played down. Make sure that this gospel, this faith that God delivered to you is seen clearly by the people around you. And oh, by the way, while you're at it, rescue people, snatching them out of the fire. So Jude takes a very militant approach uh, to our Christianity, to, to their Christianity, what it was like to be a Christian in the times uh, of the end, as things were coming to an end, as um, emotions were heightened, as desperations were setting in, as persecutions were intensified, what it was like to be a Christian 
then. So his material focused on the false teachers, what they were like, and uh, what their benefit was, and more to the point, how to view them and to deal with them. He says in, in uh, verse f- uh, 4, 5, by way of remembrance, by way of review, is I want you to remember knowing these three things. Here's a people that the Lord saved out of Egypt and yet uh, destroyed those who didn't believe. You can clearly see the parallel as uh, uh, John in his revelation uh, clearly defines the Jerusalem that then was as mystical Egypt and Sodom. Uh, that It was literally the place where the Lord was crucified, but it was spiritually Israel and Sodom, uh, Egypt and Sodom, captivity and depravity. And so God saved a people in Jude's generation out of that Egypt. Well, the people he rescued out of Egypt before, he turned around and destroyed the ones who didn't believe. What's on the shoulders of Jude's audience here? They'd been rescued out of Egypt. Uh, What would they do? What about these false teachers? uh, What would happen to them? And what would happen through them? Very serious question. But as Jude is uh, accustomed to doing, uh, he has a triplet here. He doesn't just have the people rescued out of Egypt. He also has two other examples. This is uh, Jude's um, calling card to put things out there in groups of three. And so he says, and angels who didn't sin or who didn't keep uh, the position they were given, much like these false teachers are rising above their banks, um, that they were kept, are being at the time of Jude's writing, kept in everlasting bonds. That is, these aren't breakable bonds. These aren't bonds that are reversible. They're everlasting bonds under gloom unto judgment of the great day. So they were facing the great judgment day, just like everybody, those who were brought out of spiritual Egypt, were facing that same great judgment day. And, he says, Sodom and Gomorrah. So you've got the Israelites, you've got the angels, and you've got the Sodomites. And the cities around them, with similar uh, manner, with these, pursued fornication, uh, even going after different flesh. Now watch this. Being set forth as an example in undergoing judgment of eternal fire. If you ever want to know what the uh, unquenchable or eternal fire was like, consider the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was eternal fire. Now, we have at our fingertips Google Earth or other such mapping programs where we can see aerial images, uh, recent, up-to-date aerial images of the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there is not a wisp of smoke arising from those areas. Yet, uh, they, according to Jude, are undergoing e the fire of eternal judgment or the judgment of eternal fire. Eternal fire does not mean burning, 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 burning all the way through eternity. That means a fire that is burning and taking the city down for an, for an everlasting, non-ending, unquenchable judgment. The fire doesn't have to burn forever. It just has to burn up the city forever. In other words, the city doesn't come back. The city isn't restored. The relationship is gone, and it's gone forever through a fire that lasted however long it needed to last to get the job done. Eternal fire in other words, doesn't mean burning forever. It means burned up forever. Okay, pushing on. He said, in the same way, now we're 
breaking some new ground here, verse 8, in the same way also these, these false teachers, dreaming, defile the flesh. Now, we called attention to the the, the pronouns in here, these, they, uh, and so forth, how that Jude Daisy Chains, uh, his comments about this certain group of people uh, up in verse 4, certain men crept in. And he these are the ones he's talking about, these, they, these certain men have crept in who are polluting the, the uh, message uh, for which I want you to contend earnestly. Now, let me stop and just make a, a point here. God did not put special province in the hands of the clergy that they were the defenders of the truth. He broadcast that to his entire family. You all stand up and defend the truth because there's certain men creep in and try to change it. And if you, my people, don't stand up against them, it will get changed in your hearing. And so this is a call to militant Christianity for everybody and not for a, an elite class of clergy. Uh, I, I hate the collar backward thing, uh, promoting men to a special rank when God said, you are all my children and you all need to look out for the truth of what you've learned. Okay, let me get off that uh, podium there and, and move on. Uh, what what are these? They, they, they're dreamers. They're they're um, fantasizing. I think it would be a, a way that we might want to put this dreaming, fantasizing, uh, making it up in their heads, um, and and do by that they do they defile the flesh, and so uh, making up their own special um, rules. It's okay for me. I mean, Gnosticism went down this road. It's okay for me to use my body this way because my heart belongs to Jesus. Well, fantasizing, they defile the flesh. They uh, condemn le uh, lordships, uh, rulers, uh, authorities, uh, whoever it might be that's in a position of authority, whether it's civil, uh, whether it's uh, political, uh, whether it's family, whether it's leadership within a congregation. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, these men are above it. And um, and blaspheme dignitaries. Now, uh, who are the dignitaries uh, differing from the lordships? Uh, it could simply be a Hebraic way of, of emphasizing the point, or he could be talking about uh, even um, leadership in the spiritual realm. Uh, he goes on and talks about how that uh, Michael, the ruling angel, uh, wouldn't dare to say what these men willingly say, even against somebody like Satan. There, there was a, a, a certain province that they weren't willing to cross into. It is God's business. As Paul said in Romans 14, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls. God's business is to do the judging. Uh, James says there is one judge and lawgiver, and it ain't me. So God's business is to do the judging. My business is to live according to his uh, will, to hold forth his will, and to rescue people by his will. That, and that's my business, but not to judge. Well, these are, are willing to pass all kinds of, of judgment and ridicule and out of their arrogance and self-importance. And the contrast, see, is with Michael, the, the ruling angel, when, when he was discussing concerning Moses' body, uh, disputing with the devil. And so there's an argument going on. It's kind of, in my mind, it, it, it flavors the interaction uh, that we read uh, here at the end of uh, Daniel. Not the end end, but like the... Uh, the end of Daniel 9, uh, 10, um, where he says, uh, there, end of 10 on into uh, 11, uh, verse 21, 10, 21. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth, yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these except 
Michael, your prince. And he had talked about how the, the, the prince of this country was coming up and the prince of that country. And, and, and so it's a behind the scenes in the spirit world uh, looking at what's controlling these nations and how that Michael was wrestling uh, against them. And so um, here I get this idea of Michael wrestling against Satan, contending with Satan. God's got mighty forces out there uh, working behind the scenes, doing things that were not visible to to these eyes. But Jude's point is that when Michael did that way back at the time that Moses died and Joshua took over, that he wasn't willing, he did not dare. I mean, it, for him to bring forth a, a railing accusation uh, would be for him to daringly do it he would be crossing into god's province you see as wicked as satan was and as righteous and good as as michael was it was no justification on the basis of how righteous the one was and how wicked the other was there was no justification for michael to say anything that was god's business to say that's the point, isn't it? That, uh, uh, and I'm just kind of bring that point right back down here to home, and and you just hear a lot of. Well, let me say it this way. President Trump is a is a very, uh, how should we say, his personality and his approach uh, is not a unifying healing approach. Uh, it, it, it separates people uh, quickly and, and, and easily. And there's a lot of folk who are willing to say many, many harsh things about him, uh, things that they ought not to say. Uh, he's not as bad as Satan, and they're not as good as Michael. And Michael was not willing to step into God's domain by casting aspersions at or saying harsh things about or pronouncing a railing judgment against um, Satan. And think about it. Every time a person uses the, the D word against somebody, they're doing what Michael was afraid to do. Every time we... Uh, spit out a contemptuous word against anybody. We're doing what Michael was would not dare to do. And I am not near as good as Michael, and the person I'm chewing out is not near as bad as Satan. Now let that puppy, puppy sink in. That we have no right to do anything, as Paul said, oh, no man, anything except to love him, except to love him. So we have no right to, to do that. Anyway, Jude is focusing their attention on a category of people who completely throw off uh, any concern to be godlike in, in their behavior. Um, so what did he say? Well, he did say this, the Lord reprove you. I think it's okay for me to say, you know, you're stepping into ground where God has to take control of this. I, um, you're on dangerous territory. That's okay for me to do because that's an effort to halt the madness, but not to judge it. All right, put, put, pressing on. But these, verse 10, uh, whenever, uh, whatever they do not know, all right, I, so I'm ignorant of this. Who cares? Uh, they are blaspheming it. And whatever they physically understand, you know, the lust of the body and the lust of the flesh and the, uh, and the lust of the eye and, and, and the pride of life, whatever they physically understand, uh, like irrational living things, like, uh, I mean, the, the, the male goat understands exactly what he wants out of that female goat. Uh, he understands exactly what he wants to do to that other male goat. He understands those things, and he has no qualms against doing it. He says, 
these guys, they're like these irrational, un, uh, literally illogical. They don't use logic. They just use hormones. Uh, in these, they're, they're being corrupted. They're, they're corrupting themselves by letting themselves be driven by, like illogical beast, by their desires. Woe to them! Now, whenever you see the word woe, uh, you need to understand very clearly that this is not a pronunciation of judgment. This is the groaning of a heart that sees the inevitable fall and failure. Uh, if I see two cars about to run head on into each other, I might shout out, oh no, I'm not condemning those cars. I'm observing a disaster that's about to happen. Well, that's what this word woe is. It's not a condemnation, but an observation. They're on a collision course with God. Woe to them. Oh, no, to them. So, anytime you see the word woe, you might want to just substitute our English, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. And, and you'll get the idea of what's being said here. Oh, no, to them, because they proceed. Here's another one of these triplets. They proceed in the way of Cain. What was Cain's way? Well, knowing the story, not replicating it here, Cain's way was uh, one of, of self-pity and self-righteousness. Uh, that, that, and, and so focused on self, 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 that he killed his brother, murdered his brother, uh, simply because, uh, poor me. Poor me. Why is your countenance fallen? Poor me. Okay. Um, and uh, in the wandering or the going astray, uh, interesting, this word wandering is planao, which is where we get our word planet. Uh, they're wandering. It's just out there circling around, wandering. Uh, in the going astray of Balaam's wages. Yeah. <clears throat> interesting story there. Uh, Balak offered his house full of silver and gold and, and Balaam was just coveting that, drooling as it were, willing to, to ride, <clears throat> ride out to see him even though God said don't go. Uh, but then God said, okay, if that's what you're going to do, go. But it wasn't pleasing to God as we know because the uh, dumb ass uh, reproved the madness of the prophet. But he was driven by the money. Later, the story goes on later that he could not pronounce a curse against Israel. So he counseled Balak to send in your prostitutes, to send in your temple prostitutes, seduce them into your idolatry through the lust of your flesh, and God himself will destroy them. And he got paid for it. So he wasn't concerned about the people. He wasn't concerned about the truth. He's concerned about the money. So that's what these guys are. Uh, the, the, these guys uh, are in it for themselves. They're, they're in it for the money. And, and then in the contradiction of Korah, they're destroying themselves. So just like Korah, I can be a teacher too. Uh, stand up, boldly assert their, their desire to be the teacher. They're destroying themselves. He said, so that's what they're like. They're like Cain who's just interested in self. They're like Balaam, who just wants the money. They're like Korah, who wants the position like anybody else. That's who, that's who they're like. And what they are, they're stones in your love feast. I'm not even going to talk about uh, what that is other than what it says, love feast. There, there, was, they were, there was a feast that was love, uh, a showing and, and, uh, of love. Was it a potluck supper? Might have been. Uh, but it was where love was disturbed. These guys are stones. <clears throat> I love a cherry pie. Well, I went to a friend's house one time. I, there were new, brand new Christians in the area, and they invited us over, and she made a lovely cherry pie. Guess who got the one cherry that hadn't had the pit taken out of it? That's right, it was me. I got that. What was that like, getting a cherry pit in, my, in, in a bite of my cherry pie? I love cherry pie. Hot, hot, fresh out of the oven cherry pie with a scoop of French vanilla ice cream on it. Um, I'm drooling just thinking about it right now. And then there was a stone in it. Yeah, that's what these guys are in the feast. 
they're 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 not adding value. They're they're adding injury uh, to your feast. Uh, what what are they doing? Uh, they're they're feasting together without fear. They they have no concern of what they're doing to you or to themselves. In fact, they're shepherding themselves, uh, tending, caring for, literally shepherding themselves. They're waterless clouds. Just imagine an arid or semi-arid country, um, and your crop needs water. Well, right now, here we are in Washington, in western Washington, where the annual rainfall is something like five inches a month, 60 inches a year. It doesn't come that evenly distributed, but normally we get about two inches of rain in May. So far we've had less than an eighth of an inch uh, so far in May. Uh, I I don't have much of a garden. I got a couple things. My asparagus patch desperately needs water. And so I see clouds coming over and I say, well, the, there's a promise of rain, but they come and they go. And we've had, like I said, less than an eighth of an inch of rain so far this May. And so the clouds have a promise of hope, but they don't fulfill the promise. Clouds without water, carried by winds. It gives you a, a sense of instability or transient, uh, blowing in, blowing out, coming in, blustering up like they got something, and they leave and they got nothing. And typically, if it's a waterless cloud and the wind is carrying it away, the wind is evaporating whatever moisture, soil moisture, is here already, and so drying it out even further. Um, he says, fruitless autumnal trees. Well, when would you expect to find fruit on a tree? Autumn. But these trees are fruitless. In fact, this word autumnal means late autumn. Uh, generally, what's the condition of a tree in late autumn? It's also leafless. And so he says, twice dead. They've got no fruit. They've got no ability to produce fruit. They're going to be uprooted. Wild waves of the sea foaming up their own shame. Uh, have you ever been to the ocean where the uh, sea, uh, the waves wash up against the shore? We like to go down to Ocean Shores, which is along the southern Washington coastline, or mid, mid to southern. Um, a couple rivers come into the ocean at that point, and if there's any kind of oil slick, any kind of pollution that comes in, then the tide action turns that pollution into an ugly uh, brown green, brown green foam that comes up and washes up on the shore and just lies there like an ugly mess of foam on the sand. You know, that's what these guys are like. That's what they're like. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of darkness has been kept unto eternity. I want to talk about that for uh, a little bit here. Wandering stars. Uh, the idea, as a kid, I loved to see a shooting star. It's what we call a shooting star. Uh, meteorites. Uh, <clears throat> one flashes through the atmosphere, catches your eye, man. It just catches your eye. But then, it's gone. There is no sailor in the world at that time that ever set his sextant on a shooting star. He'd find the North Star or some other consistent star. I can take a measurement. I can, I can take direction. I can, I can find my way based upon the uh, constancy of that star, but not a shooting star. Comes through, catches your attention, and is gone. It's unstable. It's uncertain. It, it's uh, un. It's useless for anything except where does a shooting star go? Into the gloom of darkness. Now you see his illustration is so appropriate that these false teachers, that's what they look like. A flash of light, 
but the gloom of darkness was reserved for them forever. Now, when you talk here about darkness, he's talking about something that was so beautifully and wonderfully uh, illustrated while Jesus was on the cross. That three hours of darkness was not accidental. And it was, it was more than just me seeing how hard it was for God to watch his son do that. It was uh, typical. It was typical of the darkness that Israel was in as they crucified the one who came to deliver them from it. An, an intense, deep, uh, impenetrable darkness that was upon uh, the nation. Let me read where I have often read here in Isaiah chapter 8. Uh, as uh, Isaiah and his disciples are hunkered down for the storm that's approaching, uh, bind up the testimony, seal up the law among my disciples, that's verse 16. Um, and then in verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, there is a call for the entire nation to be paying attention to the law and the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because they have no dawn. You see, there was a darkness coming, fast enveloping the nation uh, as the Assyrian army took them captive. It was an end to God being their light and their shepherd. Now the Gentiles would be the shepherd over God's people. It was a time of national darkness. Uh, they will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished and will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. The only time God's people will be hungry is when the curses came upon them. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. The curses would come upon them if they failed to keep the law and the testimonies. Okay, so they would be in this famine and rather than turn to the law and the testimony, they'd, they'd turn their face to heaven and curse their king and curse their God. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. They will be driven away into darkness. And here Jude says, For whom the gloom of darkness has been kept unto eternity, they will be like wandering stars shooting off into that gloom. Now, Isaiah goes on in chapter 9 and says, Yet there will be no more gloom for who, who was in anguish. In earlier times he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on he will make it glorious by the way of the sea, the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness, will see a great light. Well, that's quoted in Matthew 4. Uh, 16 of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So the gloom of darkness would re be replaced by this light that was Jesus, this enveloping light of all who came to Jesus would would be shrouded in shrouded in light. But these have nothing but the gloom of darkness and have it unto eternity because of their attitudes. Okay? Now, he says, even Enoch... <coughs> Even Enoch. Wow, does the speculation begin right here. Uh, some of the stuff that uh, I've looked into and, and, and read um, and listened to uh, indicate that this is one of those places where speculation can run rampant. And yet what, uh, <clears throat> what it says and what it doesn't say are fairly significant. Even Enoch, the eighth from Adam, prophesied, saying, The Lord came in holy marriage to do judgment against all and to reprove all souls concerning all their ungodly works of which they were ungodly and concerning all the hard things which ungodly sinners spoke against him. And it's clear from the, from the citation here that uh, Enoch was concerned about ungodliness, huh? And that Jude saw Enoch's citation as prophetic prophetic you know there was a, an ungodly high priest that made a prophecy 
it is expedient for one man to die and that the whole nation not perish. Uh, this he said being high priest. Uh, he prophesied concerning how that the death of Jesus would uh, spare the nation. Uh, John, uh, John 11. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, the high priest was intentionally making a prediction. Uh, he was stating an ungodly act for which the nation was held accountable. That is, the murder of their creator. And yet, being high priest, he prophesied of what God was actually doing. So, just because Jude said that Enoch prophesied doesn't mean that uh, it can't, it, we, we can't, on the face of it, make it any more than these words that Enoch said apply to us today. And yet, you, if you look at it, when I say us today, I'm talking about Jude, his approach to it. The us today that live when Jude wrote these things. Uh, <clears throat> yet you look at it, uh, the Lord came. That's past tense. When uh, Enoch said it, it was past tense. Uh, and Enoch's quote can't be taken as a prediction that at some later time in earth history, uh, God would do these things. Though it can be, but for the reason I'm about to state, Jude, I mean, Enoch, was describing the unchangeable character of God. He came. Now, I don't know when uh, you look, Jude is the, uh, Enoch was the eighth from Adam. Uh, you stretch out the, 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 uh, the history there, and, uh, you know, he's, uh, what, a thousand years or more away from Adam. Uh, plenty of earth history uh, going on there. But we don't know a specific event when God came in a judgment prior to Enoch. And yet Enoch's language indicates it was prior uh, to something that happened in the past. Now, Enoch was about 600 years before the flood. And maybe his comments had to do with the increasing wickedness and what God would do again. But, you know, the key word there was maybe. The, the, the point I'm getting at is uh, there's a lot of speculation about uh, this quote. But what you can take from it is uh, what you can't take from it is, well, this was written in the book of Enoch. And there is a book of Enoch. And this uh, quote very similar to this is found in it. But that book didn't come into existence until a, uh, a century or two after Jude wrote. So, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> or at least its existence was not discovered. Um, uh, and, and there's a lot of, uh, it's very, very, the, the evidence of it is very, very fragmentary. Uh, much uh, much later, it, uh, a translation of what, I mean, I'm, I'm getting boggled here in what I'm saying, that the evidence of the book came from translations from the Aramaic into Greek, and those translations uh, date to a period much later than the book of Jude. And so you can't have translation out of something that didn't exist. I know that. Somewhere, the book of Enoch came into existence. But Jude's writings cannot be uh, a statement that he was quoting from that book. The fact that the book existed might be attributed to this quotation rather than the source of it. There, there's... There, there is no way to say, well, there's a missing book. You know, <clears throat> think about that one for a minute. Oh, there's a missing book. The book of Enoch is missing. Why? And there's a lot of traffic on uh, YouTube about why did they take the book of Enoch out of the Bible? Well, there's no evidence it ever was in the Bible. 
the book exists, yeah, but when? And it went, and, and it's one of those things that didn't, uh, the evidence is that it didn't just come into existence at one time, like the book of uh, Jeremiah, which is a large book. The book of Enoch is a large book, 108 chapters. Uh, <clears throat> but the book of Jeremiah, you know, came to, into existence in the lifetime of Jeremiah as the work of Jeremiah. The book of Enoch, uh, that, that's not the case, uh, that it was over several uh, generations, if not centuries, that that uh, the final thing that that is what's in existence now came into existence. Um, it was certainly the it was revered uh, by early Christians, but there's no evidence that they ever elevated it to the level of uh, the books that they accepted as the Word of God. Okay, uh, Christians today uh, pay due respect to the writings of Flavius Josephus, but nobody considers it to be the Word of God. So, uh, by the same token, and think about this also, there are uh, things like uh, the book of Jasher and the book of Wars and even the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. You say, well, we have the book of Chronicles. No, we don't. We, we have two books called Chronicles, which are uh, extractions from the Chronicles of the Kings. Tiny little, it's, it's, it's even le worse than the Reader's Digest books, uh, the, you know, the condensed books by the Reader's Digest. The, the, what we have in the books of Chronicles <coughs> would be like going to the presidential library and taking a leaf, a, a, a single page, and saying, we'll put this in the book. Uh, it just, anyway don't want to go down that road. And the point I'm making is there are other books, writings, that are referenced in the Bible that are, are not part of the Bible and are there, but are also not considered to be inspired writings. Uh, and so, and then add to that, Paul, at least in three places, cited uh, Greek or pagan poets. Uh, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. These words are true, but he's quoted it from one of your own prophets said this. One of your own poets said this. Uh, so Paul's citing the poetry, not c claiming it to be inspired. So just because Jude quotes Enoch <clears throat> doesn't prove that the book of Enoch was an inspired book or should be considered He's doing it for one reason, and that is <clears throat> Enoch, who was the eighth from Adam, pointed to the character of God. And the character of God is that he comes with his myriads, his holy myriads, his holy thousands, to do judgment. He judges things. Now, earlier we read that Michael was unwilling, would not dare to bring a railing accusation against Satan. But here we read that God is willing to act against ungodliness. And that's why Jude said back in verse 3, you need to contend, that is, struggle intensely for the faith. Uh, you, you need to make sure it's clear, a beacon of here's where safety is, here's the way out of danger. Uh, you need to make sure that, that that beacon is clear. And more than that, you reach into the storm and you pull people out. We'll see that here in, in just a minute. He says, however, in verse uh, 16, Say there's a judgment coming and God is the one who's going to do it and you are his people and you are the rescue point in this troubled society. He says, however, of these false teachers who crept in and are wreaking all this havoc. He says, these are complaining murmurs. They proceed according to their own lusts and their mouths speak lofty things, amazing faces in favor of profit. And that's how I translated it. The idea is they're, they're wowing people so they themselves can take advantage of you. That's, that's the picture. And 
In fact, if, if I were to go back and translate this again, that's what I would say. To take advantage of you. Literally, to use. To use. That's the literal Greek word. They, they put on a, a, a front, they amaze people, but their intent is to use those people. But you, beloved. So here's, here's the trash that's come among you, the, the impressive picture that they paint, like, like uh, shooting stars, and they're, they're impressive, and, and they're bold, and they're brash, and, and, and they're aggressive, and, and they just have this aura of, wow, but all they are is emptiness and death, uh, depravity, and uh, use. They will use you. But you, beloved, you're different. Remember the words previously spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's 2 Peter 3, isn't it? I mean, that's exactly what Peter said. I'm writing, this is the second time I'm writing, to remind you of the words of your holy prophets, or the, words, the words of the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord Jesus through your apostles. See? And so Jude is saying the same thing Peter said, that they... Uh, that they said to you that in the last time there shall be mockers proceeding according to their own ungodly lust. And that's what Peter said as well. These are those who make separations, physical, devoid of spirit. That is, <clears throat> they're, they're, what did Jesus say the night uh, that he was praying in the garden just before they arrested him and the next day he's going to die? I pray, Father, that these might all be one even as you and I are one, that the world might believe that you sent me. Here, these are those who make separations. They're not there to bring a congregation together. They're there to find a group of followers who will support them. They make separations. They're physical. That's all they want. They just live for the flesh. They're devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your holy holiest faith, most holy faith, building yourself up in your most holy faith. How do you do that? You know, if, if faith is a gift from God, as, as many contend, how do you build yourself up in your most holy faith? God gave us the information. He gave us the motivation. He gave us the opportunity. He poured out his heart so that we could trust him, so that we could love him, so that we could entrust ourselves to him. And the more we know, the deeper we understand the level of his love, the depth of his love, the, 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 uh, con the completeness of his commitment to us. See, the more, the more we understand that, the more we build our heart to be strong in trusting him. <clears throat> it, the, it, it is an opportunity. I don't want to use the word responsibility. I like the word opportunity. It, it's, it's a gift. Not that we're gifted with the faith, but we're gifted with all the information that leads to faith. <clears throat> the atheist has the same gift. He just refuses to open it, that's all. But opening it and, and seeing who God is, and the more I know God, the stronger I'll be in God. See, I build myself up in my holy faith by learning the heart of God. That's how, how you do it. And, and there's there will always be more to learn. I will never know all that there is to know about the heart of God. I know more now than I did when I started, don't you? But I don't know it all, and I never will. So I continue to build myself up in uh, knowing who God is and praying in the Holy Spirit, talking to Him, pouring out my heart to Him. Keep yourself in God's love. Do, do, do you see what Jude just said? Building yourself up and praying are participials. And they modify the main verb, which is keep yourself in his love. They tell you how you keep yourself in the love of God. You keep yourself in the love of God.
by building up your faith and by praying. That's how you keep yourself in the love of God. Anticipating the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And so there's a future glimpse that they had. Uh, <clears throat> the, say, the, the, the deliverer had not yet come out of Zion to rescue his people and vindicate, uh, uh, avenge them. Vindicate them and avenge them. As Moses predicted in Deuteronomy 32, the deliverer had not yet come out of Zion, but they were anticipating it. They were anticipating that day of deliverance, that day of when the enemies would be suppressed and the uh, um, <clears throat> true children of God would be made manifest, Romans 8. They were anticipating that. And they were gearing themselves up and keeping themselves in God's love by what they were able to do, what they were permitted to do, what they were enabled to do, what they were uh, fueled to do. God gave them evidence of his care. You build yourself up. You build yourself up in your faith and you talk to me about it. And I will keep you in my love as you anticipate what's about to happen on your society here. And so as, as they could anticipate the, the terrors and the horrors and the depravity that was about to come with the, uh, how did Jesus refer to it, uh, a great tribulation such as has never been, uh, that it's coming. Daniel 12 called it the same thing, didn't he? And so they're anticipating that. They're looking at that. It was a, a horrible uh, time to, to go through. And yet it was calm seas after they crossed the bar, as it were. Calm seas, a, a peace. The enemies are gone. And, and now we have the tranquility of, of relationship with God without the enemy. Our swords beaten into plowshares, as it were. Anticipating that. And so with that on their horizon, there were people around them that either were struggling, they didn't they hadn't built themselves up in their most holy faith. They weren't praying, they they weren't connected to the, the love of God the way they could be. Should we just watch bodies floating by? and not reach out and grab a few? He says, no. In verse 22, and show those mercy who are doubting. They're not as solid as you are. You be merciful to them. What does mercy do? The mercy is that heartache that wants to help. Uh, deep, that deep compassion. I, I see somebody who's struggling with their faith, and it's easy to say, oh, that faith is on them. Jude said, be merciful. Show mercy to the ones who are doubting. Okay? So, uh, <clears throat> people who haven't built themselves up on their holy faith, what do I do? I take them under my arm uh, and uh, pull my arm over their shoulder and say, let's sit down and talk about this. And, and, and who is God? Who is this God that, that, that you're not quite sure can, can help you? Who, who is this? Now, <clears throat> I want to jump in right here and say, I know I'm keeping all of this thinking back at the calamity that occurred uh, on the Jewish nation and, and the freedom that came to the children of God because of it. I know I'm focusing on that because that's what Jude was talking about. And yet, <clears throat> and yet the, the same principles of rescuing people who are doubting, uh, who aren't quite sure that God cares? Is that only for that one period of time? Or is that for me also? Yes, for me also. Uh, to, to find those who are struggling with their faith and throw my arm around them and say, let's look at it this way. And here is God. And, and, and I know uh, in the sadness of my heart that there have been some that I let get away before realizing how far down the road they were. Uh, <clears throat> that's changing. Verse 23, but save some snatching out of the fire. And so here's this, that just 
wow, they're almost gone I and mean, in snatching. <clears throat> Whereas in uh, verse 22, there might be a, a sense of tenderness uh, and compassion. Uh, in verse 23, there's also the compassion, but you get a sense of, uh, of urgency. You might get a sense of, I mean, I might gently pick up a little baby, but you wouldn't think of snatching a little baby, just reach in and grab it and yank it out. And yet if if the mama is holding her baby in a burning room and, 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 and she's hesitant to, to make a step, you might just grab her and throw her out the window. Get out of here. This place is going to burn down. She might break her arm in the fall, but you've rescued her. Sometimes it can be brutal. It, it can be brusque. It can be uh, urgent. Okay, But then there's also show mercy on some in fear hating even the robe that's spotted from the flesh. Uh, I, I, I wonder if Jude in this third one is looking at those that you can't reach, maybe like the false teachers he's been talking about. Well, attitude. What's my attitude toward the corrupting influences around me? Uh, one of, of hatred and hostility and animosity? No, one of mercy. I hate the robe that they're wearing, but I have this compassion toward them that they're wearing it. And so it, it works on my heart to be the kind of person God wants me to be. And so he closes the book. Now to one able to guard you without stumbling and to set you over against his glory without blemish and exultation. God is able to see you through this, is what he's saying. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, glory, majesty, power, and authority for all eternity, both now and unto all eternity. Amen. You get the idea that Jude is, is passionate right here as he closes this out. There, there are people out there against us. We've got God for us. We build ourselves up in the confidence of God. We, we talk to God and get our strength and stay in the love of God, and we're rescuing people. Praise God. Well, that's where we're going to end our story today. I uh, appreciate uh, uh, your kind attention. I appreciate you listening uh, to these podcasts. I'm debating in my mind whether to look at more New Testament works. There's two grand New Testament works that, that I really haven't spent any time in, uh, both the book of Romans and the uh, book of Revelation. Haven't looked at the uh, letters of John either, have we? But um, I got this itch and this hankering to go back and lay my foundation again before addressing those New Testament works. Uh, I just have the sense that I need to go back through Moses and the prophets. Um, so unless I hear volumes of material to the contrary... My intent would be to go back um, and begin again and looking at some spot references in Genesis to get down to the book of Deuteronomy, uh, look at it more in detail, and then get on into um, maybe some of the works of David. We haven't really looked at David before getting into the prophets that followed him. Well, that's kind of my plan, and I uh, hope I get some feedback from you. But until next week, this is Rod saying, walk with God. Have a great day. Goodbye. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of Yahweh are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. For the past hour, you've been listening to Probing the Prophets with Rod MacArthur. Stay tuned each Friday for Probing the Prophets with Rod MacArthur, right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.